Well, good Friday morning, Downsview. It's the fifth day of our lockdown log here in Toronto and been doing something a little different on Fridays, calling in our Friday feature, trying to feature other authors and writers that are saturated in biblical truth that we can learn from ourselves. This morning, and I apologize, I think these books always come out backwards. I wish I was technological enough to know how to switch the image here. But it's a, it's a book by Steve Lawson, and it's called Made in Our Image. And the subtitle is, uh, What Shall We Do with a User-Friendly God? And this is an older book. It was given to me by my, my buddy, uh, Jeff McNeil, on Christmas 2002. So yeah, this has been a, a few years old. In fact, it was written in 2000, so it's, yeah, it's a 20-year-old book. But he has a concern without this, throughout this book for a recovery of biblical worship. And the way he's using the, the title there is a, a quote from Al Mohler that said that in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and now man has returned the favor that we have created God in our own image that we recreated God to be like us and the way we want him to be rather than to be the God who he presents himself to be throughout the scriptures. And so here's a couple of words of encouragement to us from Steve Lawson. The, um, it's in his chapter on only God is great. He says this, in the heavenly worship scene in the book of Revelation, all creation gives glory to God, Revelation 4, 9 to 11. Recording what he saw, the Apostle John wrote, quote, The living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. In this scene, the 24 elders, representing the redeemed of all ages, fall down before the one true God, saying, quote, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. All heaven is portrayed as giving glory to God, worshiping him, declaring his greatness, and giving him honor because he alone is worthy. They give him glory because he is glorious. Psalm 29, 1 and 2 writes this way, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the Almighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. This calls each of us to give endless glory to God the highest purpose for which we were created. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In this magnificent doxology, the Apostle invites us to praise God, to give Him glory, to recognize the glory of His name, and to acknowledge His greatness by giving Him praise. As God's children, it is our calling and our wonderful privilege to honor him, him who reigns as a king over all, who alone is glorious, and who alone is worthy to receive the glory he alone deserves. We ascribe glory to God by the way we live our lives. The more our lives conform to the image of his Son, the more glory we give him. In all that we say, in all that we do, we are to glorify our Heavenly Father. And we give God glory with our lips, we are to glorify Him in our actions. And living our lives committed to pleasing Him in every respect is that which glorifies God. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Apostle Paul wrote, Whenever then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Everything we do in life, even in carrying a multiples, basic everyday necessities such as eating and drinking, is to be done to honor Him. We glorify God by living in a manner consistent with who He is. That is to say, we must put His character on display in our lives. His holiness must become our holiness. His love, our love. His truth, our truth. This imitation glorifies Him. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.11, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves... <coughs> excuse me, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
This means that glorifying God is to be the consuming purpose that dictates and dominates the whole of who we are. The Word tells us that we are to glorify God before men, so they may see a reflection of Him in us. 1 Peter 2.12 Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of our visitation. He says here, our view of God has everything to do with how or whether we glorify Him in our lives. A diminished view of God demeans the worship we give to Him. The higher our view of God is, the greater our adoration for Him will be. Conversely, the lower the view, our view of God is, the lower our worship of Him will be. Our worship will raise no higher than our thoughts of Him. We are to worship Him in spirit and in truth, most specifically, the truth of who He is. Therefore, he guards us against our worship here, therefore user-friendly worship is a contradiction in terms because it demeans the glory of the true God, diminishes the glory of his great name, and at the same time, it produces shallow lies that do not reflect his true greatness and so rob him of the glory that is rightfully his. There is no more joyful, contented, and godly life than one that is committed to glorifying God, the real God, the God who is revealed him, revealed, who is revealed to us in his intrinsic glory and his intrinsic glory through the written word. The real God who has revealed to us his intrinsic glory through the written word. May we be people who, intently gazing on the unveiled glory of God, are transformed into that same image, as the word of God says, from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3:18. God's glory is manifested in us as we behold the greatness of his holy character and attributes. May our hearts cry, be the prayer of Moses, show me your glory. Steve Lawson used to be a pastor in Alabama. He is uh, now an adjunct professor with Ligonier Ministries and Reformed Theological Seminary and um, just a, a fine, fine man of God who 20 years ago is write, writing this, 20 years later is still seeking to live out these truths and, and help the church. I'm sorry that we're not meeting this weekend to glorify God with our assembled worship, but in this short period we hope in Toronto, our church has chosen to take a uh, a breather for a few weeks from our live worship, see if we can uh, watch and see if these numbers come under control with this whole COVID-19. It's a, it's a difficult decision, and I, and I hope you understand it's more of a difficult decision, especially for me, than sometimes it might appear. It is right for us to get together. It is right for us to worship. I don't like to call upon it's our right to do so, because any right we have is a right given to us by God. But the sweet privilege that I know for sure of worshiping with God's people is something that God, God calls his people to do. So please don't take the weekend off. Go to your computer, your iPad, your YouTube on your smart TV, however you do it. And at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we will either be premiering a video or having something live. We're still working the details out. Uh, it looks like Rick Buck, our new regional director with Feb Central is going to uh, be sending me over a video today that he's recorded for our edification at the church and we'll be able to be blessed through that. So keep your focus on the Lord, dear friends. Keep connection with one another. And when we reopen again in person, we'll just enjoy it all the more. Cheers.